So welcome to this, which is the first of two webinars on, on the Jonas Potentilla. Okay, the first thing is to say thank you, of course, to our supporters, without whom um, this wouldn't be happening. So the BSBI, of course, and the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Okay, um, I think I must start with a little bit about my background because it explains the, the structure and what I'm including in these two webinars, really. Um, I got involved with Potentilla when I was a, a new graduate. I was just embarking on a research studentship and I needed a project. And I was looking for a project on plant genetics. I was not an ecologist, I'm, I'm still not an ecologist, um, but genetics was really my thing, apart from botany, of course, I had a botany degree. So, um, my supervisor suggested that I look at the genus Potentilla because I was particularly interested in chromosomes. I didn't know anything about the genus at that point. Um, my field skills in those days were frankly rudimentary, shall we say. I mean, I'd grown up in London. I didn't have access to the countryside. Um, I was a hopeless field botanist. Anyway, I, I looked into the the genus did, did what you do, um, did a literature survey and started collecting some plants that we were going to grow in the garden that um, the university used. And this was University College London, so it's all in the middle of London. We're not in a nice country place like some of you are, I know. Um, so I had my three years studentship. I carried on working on the Potentillas for about five years after that at a, a lower level, but finishing off some of the things that I hadn't managed to do in the first three years. And after the five years, I actually gave up full-time work for a while because I had my first child. Um, but just at that point, the BSBI referee for the genus Potentilla stepped down and they needed a new one. And there I was. So um, I was about 30 at that time. I must have become one of the youngest referees, but um, a real specialist because I knew virtually nothing about anything else <laughs> and a lot about Potentilla. So if some of you watching are not BSBI members, you may not know what a, a referee does. And the BSBI keeps a list of experts and specialists on different plant groups, sometimes whole families or small, small groups like a genus, which is me, or other kinds of groups. And any BSBI member has free access to these referees. And what normally happens is that they send in a pressed plant, pressed specimen to the referee and says, please help to identify this. And that's what we do. So I'm still referee and it's terrifying to think that I'm, I'm very nearly coming up to 50 years having done it. So over the years, I have seen hundreds and hundreds of Potentilla specimens coming from all around Britain and Ireland. Um, I, I, keep, I keep a few, um, but um, mostly I just do my best to identify them and inform the sender. These days, some of them are, are pictures, photos, but um, very often a, an actual specimen is necessary. Um, of all those hundreds of specimens, more than 95% are of Erecta, Reptans, Anglica, and their hybrids. They were at the beginning, they still are. And that is, those, those three species are the real problem in this genus for us. So what I decided to do was to devote the second webinar next Saturday entirely to those three species. And I'm not going to deal with those today. So what today's webinar is going to cover is, first of all, a, a very general introduction to the genus, the general features, how you recognize a potent other species. And then we'll look at the ID features of the species that are native to Britain and Ireland but today, of course, with the exception of Erecta reptans and Anglica, because they'll be next week. And we'll look at the reasons why some of these are so difficult, which is environmental variation, polyploidy, and apomixis, because this is not a simple family. 
Um, in fact, we only have nine native species. And when I refer to our species, just like that, what I'm, what I'm meaning is the native species in Britain and Ireland. Now, some of them have a lim limited distribution. Um, some of them are not in Ireland, in fact, but um, our species, I'm referring to those. So there are um, nine altogether, six we'll talk about today. Um, there are aliens as well. There are six fairly well-established aliens and they're all keyed out in, in the flora. Now, again, when I talk about the flora and I very often refer, refer to it as the big flora, um, I am referring to Clive Stace's new flora of the British Isles, the fourth edition, which was published in 2019. So it's very recent. Um, of course, I'm not expecting you all have a copy of that. You don't, or, or even access to it. You don't need it for, for these webinars. But um, just to explain, the flora is that. You'll probably have field guides with pictures and so on. That's absolutely fine. Potentilla is a large genus. There are 300 plus species. They're north temperate to alpine, quite a lot of alpines in the family. Um, the largest number are in Asia, the lowest number in America, and I, I suppose Europe is somewhere in between. And we just have nine of all that number. Um, they're all herbaceous perennials. Um, now, some of you will be thinking, oh, hang on, what about shrubby sanctuary? Um, that's, that's not herbaceous, but the shrubby ones have been removed from the genus Potentilla. They've gone into the genus Dazifera. And if you're like me, when, when you come across a name change like this, you think, oh, that's another name to remember. But actually in this case, it's a good change because they've always been something of a misfit in the genus Potentilla. The others are all herbaceous and there are other differences as well apart apart from the shrubby feature. So um, they're all herbaceous perennials growing in fairly open sites. They're not large plants um, amongst the, certainly the wild, wild specimens. You rarely find any exceeding about 50 centimeters in, in flower. Some of them are, are much lower than that. Next week, Erecta repans anglica, recognition of their hybrids, and why? Why do they cause so many problems? Right. Um, genus Potentilla. So they show um, most of the characters of, that are typical of the herbaceous members of that family. So the leaves are alternate and they're compound. That means they're composed of leaflets. Um, leaflets fairly regularly toothed. Um, and I, the rose family is a very neat and tidy family. I, um, the parts are very symmetrical. Um, it's, I rather like it. It's very, very kind of precise. So the leaves may be either palmate or pinnate. That is palmate, which means the leaflets are all joined at one point. So fingers off your palm, very easy to remember. It is like a feather, usually um, paired leaflets, but sometimes the pairs are not quite opposite, they don't quite match. Stipules are present, and I've put this in bold because it is a diagnostic feature. Um, it's found in, I think, virtually all of the herbaceous members of the, the rose family. And you have to look for these. But let's say first, but the leaves are either stalk, like the stalk sketches I've shown above, um, and that we refer to as petiolate, but I'll probably call them stalked. The petiole is simply the name of the leaf stalk, or the technical term for the leaf stalk. Um, but the stem leaves, that is on the flowering stems that are, arise from the basal rosette, which you get, um, and they're called corline leaves. Corline means on the stem. Um, they may be sessile, which means sitting on the stone, they're unstalked. So, stipules, this will be a leaf of Potentilla erector actually, a stem leaf, 
which is sessile. And you can see, let's get my pointer. I can... There we go. Um, this represents the stem which is coming out of the screen at you. And the, this leaf has three leaflets. So it's a palmate leaf with three leaflets. And these two are stipules. They're very big. They're big enough to be extra leaflets. But you can see the shape is quite different to that of the leaflets. So they are the stipules. Stipules are part of the leaf. They're not a separate thing growing out of the stem, actually part of the leaf. Um, here's a different one. This would be Potampilla argentea. This one has five leaflets. And again, this is a sessile leaf and the stipules here are quite small. And this third one um, is a stalked leaf, a petiolate leaf, um, a palmate leaf with five leaflets and the stipules right down at the bottom of the stem. So you have to look for them. And if this is coming, coming from ground level, you really have to rummage to find them and they may be quite small. Um, this is the most typical kind of leaf for a potentour, a palmate leaf with five leaflets. You can have palmate well, they're called ternate then, palmate leaves basically with three leaflets over here, and you can have seven at the most. Um, the plant habit or the growth form of the plant, it can be erect, as in potent and erector, in which case there are basal leaves, which are naturally stalked, and then a flowering stem coming up from that, and the corline leaves may be stalked, um, but in that case, the stalks tend to get shorter as you go higher up and the leaves get smaller and simpler. But the core line leaves are the place to look for the stipules. They'll be small and difficult to find down there. But on the core line leaves, they're obvious, very obvious and important. So the second um, plant form is the plant that has short stolons. Solon is a horizontal stem, more or less horizontal anyway, which is able to root the nodes. The node is the point where the leaves arise, and you can see this is beginning to root here. They may not root straight away, they may not root until the end of the season. Um, but a plant like this, which is producing short stolons, forms a, a mat or a patch of, of growth because at the end of year one, of course, this will root, and then in year two, this is also producing short stolons. So you get quite a, a close mat of plants. But then the third possibility is this, which is to have long stolons, which we call runners, as in strawberries, everybody's familiar with that. And so you've got the original plant here, the parent plant, um, with its stalked leaves. And the runner going along and at the first node, you've got leaves and the second node and the third, third node and roots can form at any of these. You won't normally see roots at all nodes at once, but if you picked a bit and put it in a, a jar of water, um, every node would root quite readily. So you can clone these plants very easily. Right, so the flowers. Um, rosaceous flowers are regular, all of them. Actinomorphic is the long word, which you can ignore. They normally have um, five free petals and five free sepals, occasionally four in potentillary rector, obviously four, but that is very unusual. They normally have five. Petals are usually yellow, um, sometimes white, occasionally red. And now in bold, episepals are present. You have to look at the back of the flower. Very important diagnostic feature for the rose family. So here we've got the five petals, five sepals alternating, and you may or may not be able to see the tip of the sepals between the petals, depending on the species. But then a lower whirl of five episepals alternating with the sepals. So very, very important to look for that.
Now, the receptacle, look at the half flower here. The receptacle is the top of the stem that carries the flower parts. In this case, um, in, in the rose family in general, it is saucer shaped. In fact, for those experts amongst you, um, you've got the receptacle proper and you've got a hypanthium, which is sort of something underneath the, the stamens, basically, either side. But don't worry about that. The, the main point is the bit that supports the flower is saucer shaped. So the stamens are arranged around the rim of the saucer. And they are numerous. Actually, about 20 is a very common number, but there may be, may be more. Um, and then in the center, you've got the carpels, which are quite separate and free from each other. Small carpels, each with its own little style and stigma. Each is a, an independent unit, and each will form a separate fruit. And they've got one, each of them has got one ovule, so they become single seeded fruits. Um, so they are very small and they don't develop into anything very special. They're green and then they turn brown. They probably only reach two or three millimeters in length. And when they're ripe, they just drop off. They don't have any special dispersal mechanism. I suppose they depend on feet, basically. Um, okay, so there's a very typical Potentilla, Potentilla reptans, um, Sankfoil, Creeping Sankfoil is its official common name. So the, the leaf, very typical leaf, palmate with five leaflets, neatly toothed um, on a long stalk. The flowers have got five free petals. There's the stamens and the carpels in the middle, which are frustratingly yellow, because if you try to take a photograph, they just don't contrast with anything else. Um, now for a beginner, they might say, well, you know, they look like buttercups to me, and they are very similar. The flower structure in the rose family is very similar to that. In the buttercup family, the Ronanclasi, there's a buttercup, um, creeping buttercup. So it's got five separate, yellow petals, that's fine. It's got numerous stamens, very, more, very many more than potentilla, and it's got three carpels in the middle. But the shape is different. It's much more cup-shaped because these stamens are arising directly from the base of the carpels. There is no saucer under there. The potentilla flowers always look flat. It's much flatter anyway. It's a, a sort of jizz character, but there it is. And the leaf, well, you might say, okay, it's got three parts, you know, it's look palmate to me. Well, not quite actually. It's much more complicated, much more complex than the very neat and tidy potentilla leaves. Now, an issue. Um, one of the reasons that this family is so difficult. At the top it says phenotypic plasticity. I can't see it, it's got covered up on my screen, but that's fine. Um, but that is a, a long, long words, forget the words. But what it means is the ability that plants have to adapt their form to their environment. The whole point is that plants are rooted, they can't move. They're stuck wherever the seed germinated. That might not be an ideal place. So they are capable of huge variation, basically. When you plant a seed, you never know how big the plant is going to be, and that applies to all plants. Um, they will bend towards the light, they will be big or small or whatever. Now, this is a very old pressed sheet, and I, I should say, actually, all the pictures you're going to see are my own. Um, you will, next week particularly, see one or two sheets that have been sent to me as a referee, but where the sender has said you can keep some of the material and use it for your own purposes. So, but most of them are just my own. So this, this sheet was prepared in um, 1979 to 80. It's old. And so many students, I mean, dozens, hundreds of students have probably looked at this and they've stuck their rulers on top of it and it's got broken down here. But you, you look down here first. Now, where I was working, there was a lawn in front of the building with a big patch of potentilla reptans growing on it. So I collected a few runners from that patch 
and I pressed some and you can see what remains of what I pressed down here. I see this little minute, beautiful little palmate leaf with five leaflets, toothed, typical Potentilla reptans leaf. Very, very short stalk. Here's the scale, 20 centimeters. So this little leaf is no more, it's less than five centimeters in total. And that, you know, is a little one centimeter, probably, stalk. Um, okay, so I pressed that um, on the day I collected it. And then a couple of the other runners I took into the glass house and potted them up in nice Johninnis. It was Christmas time, of course, so, um, but we had lights, we had heat, lovely environment. And then I went back and I pressed some of the same plants on the 20th of February, um, 1980, in other words, four months later. So this is the same plant as that. So, I mean, I think it's just amazing. These are one clone, genetically the same plant. So when you see plants in the field, you really don't know how much of, of what you're looking at is due to the environment and how much is, is actually due to the genetic makeup of the plant. But you have to allow for this huge environmental variation and it applies to, to all of the species. Reproduction, sexual species, um, flowers, insect pollinated. That's one of the aliens actually, potent to with a, a rather attractive hoverfly. So sexual reproduction produces achenes, which are the product of these separate carpels. They're small, they're inconspicuous, they drop off as soon as they're ripe. Some species are self-incompatible, which means that they cannot fertilize themselves. Their own pollen will drop on their stigmas, but that won't fertilize the same plant like apple trees, which most people are familiar with. Um, if a plant is self-incompatible and it doesn't have a compatible mate somewhere near, then it won't set a seed. But that doesn't mean it's sterile, of course, it's perfectly fertile. So this actually makes it difficult to assess fertility in the field. And when, when I get sent specimens and people say it's fertile or it's not fertile, I always take that with a pinch of salt because they can't be absolutely sure, not always. Um, most of these species have vegetative reproduction as well, um, or sorry, asexual reproduction. Um, vegetative through runners, well, you've just seen one example of that on the last sheets, the long ones that root and, and give long distance dispersal. The runners can travel a metre or more in one season, Potentilla reptans, Potentilla and Serina are, are great travellers that way. The short ones, short, short sirlons just form matches or, um, right, mats or patches, try that. <laughs> um, but apart from the, the runners, many potentilla species are apomictic, which may, um, may make you fearful. It makes me fearful. It's a very complicated thing. Apomixis means seeds without sex, basically. They, the offspring are maternal. But in the, in the genus Potentilla, pollination is necessary for seed set. And this applies to Potentilla verna, a spring sanctuary, Potentilla crantii, the alpine one, and probably Potentilla argentia as well, hoary sanctuary. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk about apomixis, but if anyone wants to ask about it in the question session afterwards, please do but I'm not going to go on about that. Um, I will show you which species are apomictic though. Our native species, there are nine of them. Um, I won't read all the names out. We're going to, um, the last three we'll deal with next week. So that leaves only six. I'm going to say very little about Potentilla crantii. It's alpine anyway, but um, it's an un certainly an uncommon species. And then, um, really, we'll be looking at the first six, Repestris, Sterilis, Ansarina, Argentia, Verna, and Crantii. The aliens, there are six well-established ones. Those are all keyed out in stace. You're, you're pretty unlikely to come across one. I, I rarely get um, aliens to referee. 
So they're, they're not very common and mostly they're quite easy to deal with, but you would need a copy of STACE to do that. And in addition, there are, there, a lot of the, these species are very attractive and a lot of the foreign ones are grown in gardens. There's hybrids and some of those may escape. So I'm going to start with a look at Antilla rupestris, rock sanctuary. And this is an uncommon plant. This is a pressed sheet from one of the plants that I grew in the um, university garden. Um, only a few sites. There are, I think, six sites recorded now in Wales, Northern England and Scotland, and it isn't in Ireland. I haven't got a picture in the field because I've never seen it in the field and I never will. But um, leaves are pinnate in this case, um, toothed, um, sort of egg-shaped, ovate leaflets here. The flowers are white, they look a bit cream because this is a pressed specimen. So it's one of our only two white-flowered species, um, by, far the, by far the tallest of our native species. Um, it's an erect plant, it's sexual and it has no vegetative propagation, it doesn't form stolons. Um, we won't worry about this bit. The chromosome number 2n equals 14. So this was grown from seed that I obtained from the Royal Botanic Gardens queue when I started. Now I need to say something about chromosome numbers because it's a real important feature in this family and it causes problems. The offspring of any plant or animal, um, higher plant or, or animal, receive one complete set of chromosomes from each parent, mum and dad. The, the number of chromosomes in the sperm or egg cell is the basic chromosome number, single set for their species, and that number is called X. So the base, basic number is X in one chromosome set, carries all the genes for that species. The body cells contain two basic sets because the male gamete fertilizes the egg cell, so now you've got two sets. And the chromosome number in the body cells therefore is referred to as the diploid number, di2, ploid is the number of chromosome sets. So diploid number, two basic sets. Um, and that's always written as 2n, the double number, fairly easy. So remember, a, x is the base number, and 2n is the number in the body cells. When you count the chromosomes under a microscope, 2n is what you see. The chromosome number is halved in the sex organs, so that the gametes, the egg cells or pollen grains or sperm contain only one set each. If that didn't happen, the chromosome number would double in every generation, which obviously doesn't happen. And so fertilization produces a zygote, which grows into the adult with two sets. Now, if you were a zoologist, that would be the end of the slide. You're not. Occasionally, a zygote is formed with more than two chromosome sets. It's an accident that happens um, in all species, actually. This is a polyploid, so more than two sets, basically, poly, many, more than two sets. It doesn't happen in higher animals. Um, if the chromosome number goes wrong, that is inviable in higher animals. But in plants, well, plants love it. It's a fundamental difference between plants and animals. Now, the genus Pertentilla has a base number X of seven, and polyploidy is extremely common in the genus. And well, let me say, first of all, when I, when I started my project, I made a list of all the published chromosome counts for potentillas. In, in those days, there were about 100 counts, there'd be far more now. But of those 100, 19 were diploid species, which had the number, here we are at the top here, then equals 14, that's the number you'd expect in a species where the base number is seven. So I hope you know your seven times table, you can practice it by next week. But so we have a triploid, three times seven is 21. So tetraploid, pentaploid, hexaploid, 
heptaploid, we don't usually, we just say 7x at this point, octaploid, 8x, and it goes up, it will go up in members of this family, um, members of this genus, sorry, to 10x or more. It's very, very common. So a minority of the family, sorry, a minority of potentillas are diploid. Most of them are somewhere up here. The potentilla rupestris is unusual in being a diploid species with only 14 chromosomes. Now, um, it is possible to artificially induce polyploidy, and this is something I did right at the beginning of my project um, using the drug colchicine. And this plant then is an artificially induced tetraploid with 28 chromosomes. So it comes from this stock, from a seedling like this. And I'm showing you this, not just because it's scientifically interesting, but because it is important sometimes in the field because an increase in chromosome number makes the cells bigger. And that, I don't quite understand why, but that has the effect of making leaflets broader. So in the diploid, the leaflet is much longer than it's broad. But in the polyploid, the leaflet is as broad as it's long. And you can, you can, if you want to quantify it, you work out the length breadth ratio, which is lower in this than in that. And the point is, this is an extreme example. It was extraordinary, really. But you can sometimes um, detect or suspect that a plant may have a higher chromosome number if it has broader leaflets than other members of the same, of the related species. So it can be useful as a field character. So I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly. I know we took a long time getting started, but um, here we are, Pentilla serilis, the barren strawberry, the, the second white flowered species of our native species, common throughout Britain and Ireland. You're, I'm sure, all familiar with it. The leaves are ternate, three leaflets, it is a tetraploid species, 2n equals 28, that's the only chromosome number it has. And tetraploid is, is probably the most common num chromosome number actually for the genus. Many people muddle it up with the wild strawberry and can't tell the difference. We call it the barren, the common name is the barren strawberry, which is really an insult because it isn't barren, of course it isn't, it's fertile. It just isn't a strawberry. So. Here is a wild strawberry and when you put them together, they do look different. The color is a bit different. The, the potentilla is slightly more bluish green. Um, the strawberry has shiny leaves. The potentilla has hairy leaves, so they don't shine, sort of matte finish. The petals are bigger, wider in the wild strawberry. In potentilla sterilis, they're quite narrow, you can actually see the sepals quite clearly in between. But the character that I like best, that really works extraordinarily well, the leaf tips, where the terminal leaf, the terminal tooth is smaller than the two adjacent ones. So the end of the leaflet is blunt. And if you look at every leaflet, you can see that. It's a very, very um, constant feature. Now in the in the strawberry, that is just not the case. The leaflet goes, just works its way up to a point. And if the plant is not flowering, and it probably isn't because it flowers quite early in the year, so um, that is a way of doing it. And it really is a, a good way, very reliable. And this is a patch forming plant with short stolon. So there you have a, a nice big flowering patch. Grows in hedgerows especially, I think it rather likes churchyards, certainly where I live, it does. Now moving on, Potentilla anserina, silverweed. Some plants are more silver than others. Um, this was the most beautifully silver one I found on one occasion. So this is one of the pinnate leaved species um, and it forms long runners. And I'll take my pointer over here. 
Actually, I've got the parent plant covered up. It doesn't matter, it's here. Um, the runner is going all this way. This was growing in a field which is seasonally flooded. And so there was bare soil exposed when it dried out. And um, a plant with long runners, of course, can colonize very, very rapidly if it's got a patch of bare soil, sometimes grows where puddles form. Um, so this is another tetraploid species. Occasionally, people come up against plants with um, 42 chromosomes, which is 6x, sixploid, hexaploid. Um, and they, they obviously happen occasionally as a kind of mutation, really, but they, they don't um, give rise to anything else. So they're just, just an interesting abnormality, really. And they've been found at diverse places all around the, the range of this, this plant. So nothing to get terribly excited about, honestly. And there's a press specimen that shows you you get little leaflets in between the big ones. And they, in this case, they're, they're not necessarily in, in accurate pairs. There's the stipules broken off from here, but the, you can see it down there. And the very long runners that this plant produces. Under Argentia, Hori Sunkful. Now this does have a limited distribution. If you live in East Anglia, you're probably quite familiar with it because it's quite a common species there. Um, maybe the continental climate, I should think, in dry habitats, often on sand and gravel, which are well-drained. It's absent from Ireland. It's, um, it's scattered around southeast and central England, and particularly on the east coast of Scotland. Um, it hasn't got as far as Ireland. That is our hall clock telling us the time. Um, the leaflets, the leaves are palmate, and you can see down here the leaf with five leaflets, neatly toothed as ever. Um, it has small stipules, not very obvious. The leaflets tend to look narrow because the edges are underrolled. The underside has silvery hairs, and you can um, you can see this. Oops, I've actually got to move this away. Here we are. So I can see what's down below. Um, you need to look under the leaf. We'll look at that in just a second in the next slide. Chromosome number of the British species is 14. And as far as I know, nothing else has been recorded from Britain. However, from the continent, numbers of 14, 28, 35, 42, and 56. So it occurs in 2x, 4x, 5x, 6x, and 8x forms. And it's generally apomictic, although the dipules, the diploids on the continent certainly may be sexual. However, um, the diploids in Britain certainly some of them have been shown to be apomictic as well. So this is one of the apomictic species. Now, if you see a whole range of chromosome numbers looking like this, that shouts at you that this is an apomictic species because numbers like this, um, I mean, they just can't cope with being sexual, basically. <laughs> Certainly the odd numbers like 35 can't. Um, I said you'd see the underside of the leaf is, um, you can see these leaflets are very narrow and this is a press specimen, so it looks rather gray, but underneath you can see the silvery hairs and the, the dark line around the edge, which is the under rolled upper surface of the leaf. All right, we're nearly at the end of the species of today's presentation. Potentilla verna, spring sunk foil. The old names, Potentilla taberni montani and Potentilla newmaniana, I give you those because you still find them very often in lists. So if you look for Potentilla verna, the nice simple name, which means spring, of course, spring sunk foil, um, you may not find it. So then try taberni montani, and if you still can't find it, try newmaniana. So this is one of the mat forming species with short stolons. Um, it grows in relatively few sites, it's scarce, widely scattered sites in England, Wales and Scotland. It's fairly 
more or less lowland, but it's absent from Ireland. Um, so leaves with five to seven leaflets in this case, and you'll see that in a minute, inflorescences with only one to a few flowers, morphologically very variable and apomictic, and polyploid, whole range of chromosome numbers, generally 6x or 7x, 42 or 49, but 56, approximately 63 and 70, have also been recorded in British populations. So clearly this is an apomictic species, very variable as a result of that, and taxonomically very difficult as apomicts are. Now, um, I've, I've zoomed in on this little bit of this particular picture, which is that, because it shows you the seven leaflets. If we look particularly at this one here, blowing it up as far as I could, you've got the typical five leaflets, one, two, three, four, five, and a little pair at the bottom making seven. And if you look around, you'll see that nicely down here. Um, not all leaves have the extra ones, but there's just one of them there and so on. Um, so that, I don't know how reliable that is as a diagnostic feature for this species, but I think it's pretty good. Um, Stasis flora actually says leaflet number five to seven. So I think it's a pretty good feature. So if we move on just quickly to the last one, Antelocrantia alpine sanctuary, I'm not showing you a picture. I have never seen it in the wild. I'm not a mountain walker, I never was. It's a scarce species. You'll find it in Snowdonia, North Pennines, Scottish Highlands. So if you are an alpine type of person, you'll enjoy looking for that. And it's an attractive, species when it's in flower. It's very closely related to Verna, morphologically similar to it, except that it doesn't have the stolons, it doesn't form mats, it's an erect species. Um, although the, the flower stalks may not be very erect. Like Verna, it's apomictic, polyploid at 6x and 7x levels, 42 and 49. And on the rare occasions when the two species meet, they can hybridize but they're both apomictic. And I mean, this just adds to the huge taxonomic difficulties between these plants. This is a project waiting to, to, to be done, basically, for someone who will travel around and do the ecology, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult one to tackle. So, um, that's the end of today's subject. But before you come again next week, um, you, could, you could look for some potent tillers and count or measure how many leaflets you can find. Is the leaflet number constant? If not, count along the stem from the base to the apex and see how it changes. Um, how many petals or sepals? If there aren't any pe petals because it's too late in the year, you'll, you'll find sepals which survive around the developing fruits? Is it erect or prostrate? Um, what shape are the stipules? How long are the petioles? Is it rooting at the nodes? Um, and these are all the things you have to look at. And actually one more thing, measure the longest runner you can find. We might have a, might manage a small competition on that next week, I'm not sure. But, um, these are all the things you have to look at, and particularly when you're tackling Erecta reptans and Anglica. So this is, is really preparation for the next session and to get your eye in and, and to get used to looking for these diagnostic features, um, the stipules, um, whether it's the, the runners, how long they are, and how does the leaflet number change. So, um, that's it, um, and hope you've enjoyed and found this useful, that you'll join us next week for part two on these very common species that you might have a, and I think Jim is, is going to make available actually um, a sheet of those 
things to do that you could actually print off yourselves. Recommended books there, obviously Stasis Flora, the fourth edition, 2019, which gives very good accounts of the species and hybrids. It's very well up to date um, and includes the, the keys out the communist aliens. Uh, uh, if you want pictures, as obviously everyone does, there's Streeter, um, Collins Wildflower Guide, and also the older Wildflower Guide, um, The Wildflower Key by Rose, 2006. The accounts are, are not brilliant. Um, it's too complicated for a book at that level, but both books have very good illustrations of the species, not the hybrids, of course. Um, the Vegetative Key, if you try that, um, okay, yes. <laughs> Uh, what should I say? It's it's useful, but it really isn't sufficient given the, the variation in these species and hybrids. And I was slightly amused, really, to see that um, Poland mentions the fertility of, of the hybrids, although this is supposed to be a vegetative key. In other words, I think that's a tacit admission that um, you can't do it entirely on vegetative characters. It's, it's hard. So... Um, that's it. Thanks to our supporters, with, without which this wouldn't happen. Brenda, thank, thank you very much. That, oh. that, was, that was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, so we're, we're running a little bit late, everyone, but we, we've got time for a few questions. Um, Paul, would you, would you like to put the first question to, to Brenda, please? Yeah, there's a question for Maria Roberts, can you briefly explain, Aptometrius in particular, why pollination is necessary for reproduction asexual? Yeah, there are various, there are various different kinds of Aptometrius, but the kind that happens in the potentillas is something called pseudogamy. But this means that seed set is stimulated by pollination. And it has to be pollination either by the same species or a closely related one, not just any old pollen. And in fact, the, um, as some of you will know, and most of you probably won't, in um, when a, a flower is pollinated, the pollen grain grows a, a pollen tube, which grows right down the, the style to the ovules at the bottom. And the male nucleus travels right down that tube but also a second nucleus goes down as well. So for reproduction in plants is horribly complicated. It takes two nuclei. Now that second nucleus is involved in the formation of the food store in the seed. And in the kind of apomixis in Potentilla, it's only half evolved apomixis really. It, it still needs that second nucleus to make a food store without which you can't get a, um, a viable seedling. But the, the actual male nucleus does not fertilize the egg cell. The, um, the embryo forms from a maternal cell somewhere else in the, in the ovule. It's horrible. Um, and because of that, um, occasionally, of course, the, both nuclei get down and, and there is fertilization of an ovule. So the seeds that you get um, are likely every now and then to include an actual sexual hybrid or an actual sexual offspring mixed up with a large number of maternal ones. <laughs> you know, it's, it's diabolical, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask um, a, another question from Maria? Uh, she asked in uh, Potentilla verna, spring sanctifoil, the, does the number of leaflets relate to the poly point? polyploidy level? I don't know. Um, I've, it, 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 it can happen, I think, very rarely in potent reptans, which just has one number of 28. Um, I, no, I think it's, it's just a feature of, of that species. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope it doesn't, I don't think it would occur in Crancii, um, in stays, certainly it says the leaflet number in Crancia is three to five. Yeah. So that's very likely to, very unlikely to have seven ever. Um, now, I've, I've got a question of my own. I've, I've always puzzled uh, that Potentilla sterilis and Fragaria vesca are so similar. Um, 
and uh, e even the early botanists distinguished them. What 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 makes a potentilla potentilla and fragaria fragaria? I I haven't seen the DNA results. I I would like to actually. I should contact somebody who deals with these things. But I rather suspect that Fragaria should be a Persian tiller. Oh. Because you, you have also something in the genus Persian tiller now, which used to be called Duchenia indica, and now it's Persian tiller indica. It's called the yellow flowered strawberry. It has fruits that look just like strawberries because they've got the big swollen red um, receptacle, actually, the fruit, false fruit. Um, if you taste one, they taste like cotton wool. They've got no juice or flavor, but they look like strawberries. Yeah. But they're now, well, that the genus has now been brought into Potentilla. Um, but I, I mean, there would be an outcry if we suddenly started saying strawberries are not Fragaria anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I look forward to uh, the, the, the next edition of Steaks and, and see you. I'll be interested to see where Fregaria is there. there. Oh, that's right. Just wait for that. <laughs> okay, I think uh, I think we should call a halt there because we, we've overrun. Uh, so apologies, everyone, for, for that. Brenda, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Uh, I really enjoyed that. It was fascinating. I hope everyone else enjoyed that. And I look forward to seeing everyone next Saturday. Uh, so thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Lise, in the background, and thank you to all our participants. Okay, good morning. <laughs>